The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each weekend, we discuss talks from the most recent General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's right. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and have a bit of fun as we study the words of the awesome men and women that God has called to direct His church in the latter days. I'm Rhonda Farr. And I'm Meg Tilton. This episode, we are talking about Elder Hugo Montoya's address, The Eternal Principle of Love. So welcome to the podcast, Rhonda. You've never been on before. Thank you. It's so fun to be here. I'm excited about this. Yes. Rhonda and I know each other professionally, but we've become good friends too. So we are both life coaches. And so we have spent some significant time together. I did first though, want to give a little bit of a background on who Hugo Montoya is. The thing I thought was really interesting is he is born in in the United States, but he must have moved back to Mexico or South America because he does have an accent when he speaks. And so I don't think he's a native English speaker anyway, but he got a degree in from Sonora state university, a bachelor's degree, and he served in a number of callings, including full-time missionary, young men's president, elders, quorum president, high counselor, bishop counselor in the state presidency, state president, assistant area authority, and area auditor for the Mexico area. And I thought this was really kind of cool. His It talked about the areas that he's worked. So he worked on a vineyard, a great vineyard, for over 20, almost 20 years, actually. And then he worked for Xerox, and he was an HR manager. And I thought this was really funny. He and his wife were the owners of a tortilla shop from 1993 to 2011. I'm like, that's a lot of tortillas, but I'm sure they are probably pretty amazing, better than the the kind I get in the grocery store. So anyway, that's a little bit of a background on him. So yes, he seems like a very, very humble man who just really loves the Lord. And that's what we're going to talk more about today. So as you were reading this talk, Rhonda, what did you find really stood out to you? What are some things that you liked? I'm so glad you asked. I kind of broke it down into a few themes. So I'll start with the first one that came up for me and one that I am actually super passionate about. So Elder Montoya talks about when President Nelson announced that we were going to implement a newer and holier approach to caring for others. And of course, that was the ministering program. But as I was reading this, I thought about how this newer and holier approach really includes and relies on our agency, our choice. And a little further down the talk, He does address that. He talks about how Heavenly Father, the Savior's plan includes agency. And then one of the things I'm most passionate about, he says, therefore, we will likely make mistakes. (laughs) Not (laughs) likely. I would even say like we are going to make mistakes. And I am so passionate about this with my kids. I tell everybody, like, let's just normalize repentance. Let's just normalize getting it wrong. Because that's why we're here and we're all going to do it. So I might go a little overboard with telling people that mistakes are part of it. We don't need to feel a lot of shame around those mistakes. I mean, some guilt, obviously, that's part of the plan too. But oh, I could talk about this forever. So I'll, I'll hear what you have to say about that. But I, I have so much. To- yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. I kind of jokingly, unjokingly tell people, my friends, a lot of times, I'm like, you know how we refer to the plan of happiness? I really think it should be the plan of mistakes. Like this is the plan of mistakes and how to navigate them and overcome them and really understand that mistakes and mistakes too is just in a definition, right? If 
we don't have to really look at them as mistakes. They can be growth points, right? Like where, oh, I did something, I had feedback, I had internal feedback, I learned a ton of stuff, and now what am I going to do moving forward? And I kind of think that that's maybe how Heavenly Father views them as like, these are just growth points, like you get to learn and expand. And ultimately, what I think Heavenly Father is always driving at is how are you going to connect with me, right? How are you going to become more like me? I really liked his definition. What he said holier meant to him, it meant more personal, deeper, more like the Savior's way. And I thought, yeah, that's what we all want is we want more personal and deeper and more connection, not only with the people that we minister to or the people that are in our lives, but also with God. And that's how we become holier. So, yeah. And I will add to that more personal and a deeper connection to ourselves. (laughs) Yeah. I think you're right that it, that anchor when we can dive into using that agency in a more personal relationship is that's how our testimonies really grow. That's how our testimonies, you know, I think about this. I've heard people describe phases of development and growth, not just in testimonies, but lots of areas of life in ways that make us think about, you know, rule following, which I think some people can say the church has in the past been really into rule following, right? We think about how we've changed for strength of youth and the check boxes for ministering, what used to be the visiting and home teaching. Uh, but that is also an important step for a time, right? Like our little children, like we need to tell them about rules. But then comes this thing that you just said, right? But then if we want to develop more deep and personal relationships to God and to ourselves and all the things, that's where we have to use our agency and some thought and anchor in what's important to us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I of course love that because I think that we often overlook that point of anchoring into ourselves and having that deep and personal relationship with ourselves and how really when you have that, it affects every other relationship in your life, for sure. So well said. You know what, Meg? I'll never forget. I was at school and we were asked, it was a proclamation to the family class, and we were asked to write a paper on, you know, a portion of the relationship that we had with our heavenly father and our brother, our savior. And I remember like thinking, what are the defining moments in this relationship that I have now? And of course, it's still evolved since that time. But it really was my mistakes that anchored me to my father. And I can remember as a teenager, I grew up in Tennessee. You might hear a little bit of accent. I'm still here right now. There were not a lot of members of the church at my high school. And I didn't always make the best decisions. Sometimes I did. And and many times I didn't. But I remember having to go to my heavenly father and say, I did this again. And please help me. Like, I'm trying, but I don't know how. And I remember, you know, thinking about my Savior and thinking, thank you. Thank you for taking this on for me. Thank you for doing this with me. And I will have to say, if not for those moments of feeling completely in a, unable or inadequate to do this on my own and really feeling like I had to tie myself to my Heavenly Father and my Savior for that help, I would not have the more deep, the more personal relationship that I have with them now. Like you think about even a spouse or your children, like when you can go to someone and say, I'm really not good at this. I'm trying so hard. This is what I'm working with. Like, what do you think of me? Like, how can we do this together? Even like a spouse or a child, that's how we anchor to these relationships too. So of course, we think about that even tenfold with our Heavenly Father and our Savior who know us so well, who know us by name, which I think is mentioned later in the talk. So, yeah, that's a beautiful example. This week in seminary, I am teaching the gospel of John chapter one, which we're all studying for come follow me. And yesterday I didn't have very many students because one of the school districts was off. And it was really interesting because we were talking about Christ and what he was like before he came to earth. And then what he had to subject himself to or condescend to in coming to earth. And it was so interesting because as I I broke people up into little groups and they discussed certain scriptures about how he was rejected, how he suffered, how he had all of these 
just mortal experiences that were hard and difficult. And I had told my class, I'm like, you got to understand, like he was the man right in heaven. Like he was making worlds, creating galaxies. Like he was having the best time. And then he comes down to this earth where it's really hard. People, his own people reject him. He's scorned all of those things. And it was so interesting because as we read those scriptures, the spirit just filled the room. Like it filled the room. And I brought it up again today. And I asked, I said, you know, we feel the spirit a lot. And I think the spirit is here often in seminary. But yesterday I really felt it. Did anybody else feel it? And when did it come? And one of my students raised his hand. He's like, I felt it when we started talking about how God suffered so much, you know, Christ suffered so much for us. And I just thought, there's the relation, there's the deep and personal, there's the connection that we have with Christ and why he had to come of a mortal mother, because that allows us to have that connection to him. And it was just a really profound and touching experience to feel the spirit bear witness of that and have several, my other, my co-teacher also felt it. And then the student verbalized it as well. And just how important that is to not shy away from those hard things, because that's what really does connect us to one another, to ourselves, like you said, and ultimately to our Savior and our Heavenly Father. Uh, I love that. While you were talking, it made me think of a Maxwell quote, and I quickly just pulled it up. But it made me think of what he says. He, He says, sometimes we'll say, keep from me, Lord, all those experiences which made thee what thou art. Then let me come dwell with thee and fully share thy joy. And then he says, goes on to the crop later and says, that's not really how it works. He's like, if we are to truly dwell with him and share in that experience, we don't have to feel exactly what he felt, but there will be a little bit of that, right? We can't say, keep from me, Lord, all those things, but give me all that thou hast. It's just not how it works. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. And I think in in line with what President or Elder Montoya was kind of saying, you know, his his title of his talk is, you know, eternal principle of love. And we can often think, oh, if I'm going through something hard or something difficult, it means that Heavenly Father doesn't love me. And maybe perhaps it's the exact opposite. Like actually he does. <laughs> and he wants you to become more like him and he wants you to turn to him and have these deep personal experiences with him. And the best way that he knows that that's going to happen is through going through mortality and having these mortal experiences that are often very hard and difficult. That's so true. Where do we even get that idea that life's going to be easy for righteous? Because all of us think that, right? As soon as things go terribly wrong, we're like, what did I do? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you helping me? It's throughout the scriptures. If the Savior himself isn't the best example, I often tell the people I teach, just open the Book of Mormon. It is the first book in the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi. It is the first chapter. It is the first verse. It is the first sentence in the Book of Mormon that says, I have seen many tribulations and I am highly favored of the Lord. Both of those, he says in the very first sentence, it's like, Here, how many times do we read the first chapter of the Book of Mormon over and over, you know, when we start and we don't finish, we start again. The Lord is telling us, you can be highly favored. I can love you so much and you're going to see some hard things. That is the human state. That is what helps us grow and learn and progress. Yeah. And Elder Montoya does talk about that. He says, even when we do what is right, the circumstances in our lives can change from good to bad, from happiness to sadness. God answers our prayers according to his infinite mercy and love and in his own time. And he does, you know, he brings up several really cool examples, I think, like the book from Elijah to he drank from or the brook, sorry, the brook where Elijah drank, the water dried up. Nephi's still bow was broken. Like, I just think, I think I would have been really ticked if if my bow was broken. I'd be like, yes, we need to be out here in the wilderness, all this stuff. And now my bow breaks. Great. And his brothers were right. But he was like, no, this is an opportunity for me to rely on Heavenly Father. 
or, you know, a young boy is discriminated against and expelled from school, a long awaited for child died within days of being born. Those are all things that he said, you know, you have this happiness and then this sadness. And yeah, those can be very poignant times in our lives. And, and we get to choose if we want to turn to the savior and Jesus Christ and the God or not. Yeah. And I think it can happen because of our own choices and our own learning. Sometimes we face adversity, sin, mistakes, and then sometimes it's just because we're human living in this fallen world. I love to piggyback on what you just read when Elder Montoya says, adversity in our lives can cause doubt and the fulfillment of the promises that have been made for us. And I've seen that many times, like, Heavenly Father, is this really going to work out? Like, really? Is And sometimes it's because of my own sin that I'm like, oh, crap, did I screw everything up? Is Like, is everything lost? But here's the part that I love the most from Elder Montoya. He says, please trust in our father. He always keeps his promises. Oh, I love that reassurance. Yeah. And it always brings you back to when we studied like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? There's this like really poignant part where they're getting thrown into the furnace of fire. And one of them says, I know our God will save us. And And another one says, but if he doesn't, if he doesn't save us from this fire, he is still the God that I, that I have professed that he is like the fact that he's saving us in this moment is not really what's important. It's, they had a much bigger picture of, and a big, huge faith in this God that is like, he's going to save me. It might not be from this fire, but ultimately I will be saved by him. And he keeps his promises. Yes. Isn't it so hard to remember that in the moments? (laughs) There's something I will add to that. There's this awesome guy who's in our ward, and he admittedly has had a rough background. He shared that pretty openly. He's in the process of getting some of his tattoos removed, but even just looking at him, like you can just see like he has lived a life where he has had a lot of different experience. So one day we're in Sunday school and we're talking about this, like we got to trust in the Lord and kind of what we're saying, like he will deliver us, but we are going to be tried And this sweet brother raises his hand. He goes, I also think it's important to remember that if we don't want to go through the trials and it feels too scary and too overwhelming, that's okay too. He's like, you guys remember on the cross when the Savior said, Father, like if we can at all, please remove this cup. Like even the Savior himself said, like, you know, I'd rather not drink it if I don't have to. But the important part is not that we have to never like, be scared or whatever. It's like, but if thou wilt, I'll drink it up. Like, I, I know that I can trust you. And I have this little human part of me too. That's like, ah, I'd rather not. And I think it's important to call that out. Like, cause I think we're going to experience both. Yeah. I think that that is really, really an important part because, you know, even in that story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, like, that's what we hear. And we're like, Oh, like they had no emotions. They had no fear. They had no hesitation, but I'm like, I think anybody with any amount of faith getting thrown into a fiery furnace, I don't think you'd be super excited about that. Like, I think there would be some trepidation just because, I don't know, this the mortal body in and of itself, its one job is to keep you alive, right? So it's going to be like, this is a bad idea. And as they're going into the furnace too, the, the guards die because it's so hot. The ones that were throwing them in, right? So- you know, I think that a lot of times, at least I feel like when I was being raised, it was like, if you have fear, then you can't have faith. And I'm like, but could we, can we hold space for both of those? Like acknowledge the fear and still move forward in faith. I think that that's a really important concept to be able to grasp and really look at the whole picture. Like we were talking in Relief Society a couple of weeks ago and we studied a talk by another talk from General Conference. I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but she was talking about having a judgment, like being how we have judgment for others. And I looked up another talk on judgment and this man was talking about Mary and Martha. And he's like, you know, Martha kind of got chastised a little bit because she was like cleaning up the house. And she's like, Mary's just sitting there, you know, listening to you, not helping you. I feel like I'm Martha a lot of times, like with my kids, like, please clean up the house, you know? (laughs) Anyway, 
But he brought up a really good point because when Lazarus died, she was the one, she was the one that ran to Christ and said, Lord, like, can you help me? Like my, my, my son has died. So she had faith in Christ. And sometimes we only look at one instance in somebody's life or even like harbor on an instant in our own life and say, Oh, I'm so terrible. I didn't have faith or I didn't do this right. And I think that's really where Satan gets in where God is like, I'm looking at the whole picture right? I'm looking at the whole being like, yes, you're going to have moments of fear and doubt, but you are also going to have these amazing moments of faith and dedication and perseverance. And can we have all of those? And collectively, when it all comes together, it's a really positive and great thing. I love that you shared that. And I have a, a story that sticks out from the Book of Mormon that is similar. I'll share it quickly if that's okay. But it's Sariah when she complains against Lehi, right? Like, here they are. They have nothing. Their kids are gone. Their sons have gone back to get the place. She thinks they're probably dead. They have no idea, right? And she starts to murmur against Lehi. And I've been in Sunday school classes before where people are like, yep, see, she's doubting. I think, my goodness, (laughs) as a mom who thinks their children are dead and like, you're, you said you can have fear and faith at the same time. I love that concept. And I would even add the word nervous system to it, right? We have a nervous system. Like it is designed, as you said, to keep us alive. Biologically, when you think your children are in danger or threatened, you have a nervous system stress response, right? So The idea of saying that a mother isn't having faith when she's just having a stress response because of her body, the way Heavenly Father designed it, is just absurd to me. But I love the second part of the story to what you said, like they come back and and they learn through this trial. And she says, now I know of a surety, right? That what we're doing is okay. She uses that word surety. And I think that's the same way with our trial. Sometimes there will be fear. There will be a combination of fear and faith, right? There will be that learning we talked about. That is by divine design that those things play together in my experience so that then I can have more faith and more surety going forward. And I just want to take the shame out of, like we said before, the uncertainty, the fearing, like the stressfulness that can coexist with the faith, as you said. I love that you brought that up together. Yeah, because I I think we really need to realize like Heavenly Father sent us to earth and he even talks about this, that there's opposition in all things. So he's not like, I'm not expecting fear to be there. I can't believe fear's there. Why are you fearful? He's like, yeah, it's totally going to be there just as much as faith is. And then that's our opportunity to to use our agency to say, okay, which one am I going to really choose? You know, because we don't often look at it as a choice, but then have a lot of compassion too, when we might be leaning a little bit more towards the fear part, because sometimes there isn't understanding, there isn't clarification. Like she was like, I know my husband has told me that my sons should go back and get the plates and I followed you into the wilderness and I'm trying to do everything that Heavenly Father has asked me to do, but I am just having a really hard time not thinking that they're dead you know? And I think when they came back alive and they told the story, because that's the thing too, they probably told the story. Nephi's like, let me tell you how it went down. Like, first of all, we got there. We had no idea what to do. First, we tried this. Then we tried this. Then we tried this. Then this is ultimately what ended up happening, you know? And so she saw the hand of the Lord in all of that. And that just built her testimony. And so she was able to calm that fear part down and say, okay, now I can live in faith more fully. So I think the scripture that encompasses what you just said, if we could like wrap it up in one verse is Ether 12, 27, right? The Lord says that he gives us weaknesses on purpose. He doesn't say on purpose. I do. Right. So that we'll be humble. So yeah, we're going to doubt and we're going to fear. He gives us weaknesses so that we will come to him. That's what that verse says. And then the second part is the part we love to quote, which I love it too, right? If we come to him, then those weaknesses can be strengths. But we see that in the women we're just talking about, right? They struggle a little. They have their fears. They have their doubts. Then through that and coming to the Lord and trusting and getting more light and knowledge and clarity, 
then they become stronger and more faithful because of it. I did find one little line, which kind of goes along with what we're talking about here too, that Elder Montoya said that I was like, I do have a question mark by it. It's towards the end. It's the third paragraph from the end. He says, Jesus walked with no fear and with no doubt to Gethsemane. And I'm like, was that really true? I don't know that he didn't have fear or that he wasn't like having a little bit of doubt because I think a lot of times we think that those are negative emotions, but they're very informative emotions. And I'm wondering if really what it was is he's like, I see the fear. I see the doubt. I can, I can have a space for that, but I'm not going to hearken to it. I'm going to trust my father and walk full, you know, fully with trust into him. Right. I I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I feel like he didn't have fear or doubt. That's interesting. I I glossed right over that one. So I'm glad you bring it out. I'll tell you what my thought is as you say that. I'm thinking about times when I have had a response in my body that felt terrible, but intellectually I knew I was safe. So for example, my brother passed away in a car accident when I was young. And one of our friends recently passed away too. He was younger than us actually. And like my body just was making all these connections. Like You've probably heard that book, The Body Keeps the Score. You and I are emotions gurus, so we love this stuff. But I remember going to sleep at night and having feelings like I felt when my brother had passed. And so I was having like a stress response, but intellectually, I knew that everything was okay. And sometimes I think about it that way too, right? Like if I totally trusted the Savior, but I was doing something really out of my comfort zone, I wonder if it might be like, okay, like you said. I'm having a nervous system response or or to use a phrase that some people may maybe have heard like a trauma response, but intellectually, like I'm fully trusting that everything is fine. I'm fully trusting that I'm safe. I just wonder, like, as you're saying this, I started wondering about the human part of Jesus. We know that he has like a mortal mother, right? Like, what does that mean for his nervous system, right? Like, what does that mean for his stress response? Like he has this godly side of him that is like trust and perfection. But what do you think about that? Do you think like he felt stress responses like that? Do you think that he like had that? I mean, in some ways I do. I guess I do believe that. I mean, there is that scripture where, you know, he knows he's going into the garden of Gethsemane. He's like, is there any other way? Like, can we do this any other way? Like, I don't really want to do this. So that to me, that means it's like, I'm, he was 100% willing, but he was like, if there's another way I'm willing to do that too. Right. Like, because he knew, he knew to some degree, because I don't think he fully knew until he suffered in Gethsemane, what it really was, but he knew enough. He'd experienced enough of mortality to know, I know what pain feels like. I know what rejection feels like. I know what Pain, it feels like to lose somebody you love. I mean, John the Baptist had been killed, right? I know what it feels like to be rejected and, and persecuted for what you believe and to be somebody and have your own people not believe you. Like, he's like, I know what that all means. Like, and he's like, and I know there's a lot of other experiences that I haven't ever experienced, but I've seen probably, he'd probably seen people he loved and cared about go through them. Like he'd, it's not documented that he'd lost a brother, but Mary and Martha had lost Lazarus and he'd seen the pain that that had caused them. Like what, you know, he's like, I know what this is going to entail. And I'm not, you know, he's like, I'm willing to do it because he loved Heavenly Father so deeply and completely that he's like, I can do this, but he didn't want to. So I think there was like a mortal part of him that's like, oh, this is going to be terrible. I'm not so sure. And I, and I think that that's something that elder Montoya does a really good job about is like, it's like, it's hard. It is going to be hard. And, but in the end, God loves us. And he demonstrates that love through the savior, through the suffering that he went through that we, because he suffered that we can endure all things. And, uh, you know, I think the main thing I really kind of came away from this talk was, is that he's like, just keep believing in God. Like he answers his prayers. It's like what you said before, like he answers his prayers, your prayers. He like wants the best for you and he keeps his promises. That's just such a beautiful, beautiful 
message to give. Yeah, I love it. If we have time, I'd love to share one more experience as you were saying that it it made me think of, you know, here we are, we're here to have this experience and all of it is an expression of love as I hear you say that, right? Like even the hard things we talked about earlier, even like our own mistakes and being allowed to be in this mortal state. Somebody in one of my Sunday school classes one time, he said, you know, I heard this story of a guy. He was like a football player and he was talking about how he wanted to be the best and the coaches kind of ignored him, right? They weren't hard on him. They didn't challenge him. They didn't give him a lot of in-person experience. And he was like, you know, some people might look at that and be like, oh, that was awesome. You didn't get like pushed so hard and they didn't require as much of you. But he's like, all that did was send me a message that they didn't believe in me. They didn't believe in my potential. They didn't think that I had what it take, took to grow and be contributor, all the things. And he said, you know, I've thought about that in life many times. Like if God just like put you over to the side, like, okay, I won't push you. I won't challenge you. I won't give you anything. You can just have like this ho-hum existence. He's like, I think what that would really be saying to us is he doesn't think I have anything to offer here. Like he doesn't see the potential and the growth to push me a little bit. That's kind of stuck in my mind. Like we think we want this ease. We think we want this lack of friction in our lives, this lack of pressure. But really, that is God saying, I love you. And I want you to reach that higher version of yourself and that potential. And I actually already see it in you. Let's bring it out. Yeah. That's beautiful. I really do think there's nothing, nothing of ease. The way that you feel in ease can never compare to how you feel after you've conquered something that was very difficult and hard. Like there's just a different feeling within you, you like you have grown. And I think it's just what, you know, Heavenly Father wants for us, what you're saying. He wants us to grow. He sees the potential He's like, I'm here. I'm going to keep my promises, you know? And I really do think that's what kind of the title of this talk, the eternal principle of love. Like I'm always here. I will always keep my promises so you can be put through these things and grow and learn and become more like me. Like he just wants us to know that. And that's a powerful, powerful expression of his love. But I, I don't think we often see that really quickly. There's a lady in my ward that was just diagnosed with cancer and her mother was in the temple and was telling another worker there that her daughter had cancer. And this other woman came over and she's like, oh my gosh, I am so excited for your daughter. Like she is going, and she's like, did you hear that she has cancer? <laughs> she's like, yes. She's like, she is going to learn so much. She is going to come to know the savior so much through this experience. And I thought, well, what would that be like if we were all like that when we're faced with some huge trial? Like, you know, this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to grow and really feel our Heavenly Father and Savior's love and become more like them. Mm, that gave me goosebumps when you said that. And I was like, oh yeah, feel the fear, the uncertainty, and then the trust, just like we just talked about. That's that's interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today. And thank you for having me. I love these discussions. So fun. Okay. Well, to all the listeners, thanks for joining us as well. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. This episode, we discussed the eternal principles of love by Elder Hugo Montoya. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and everywhere you get podcasts. You can find links to all our platform, our podcast platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org. Conferencetalk.org is also where you can follow us on social media, drop us a comment, check out the show notes, find the resources we mentioned in the episodes, and learn more about us, your hosts. If you want to follow me, Meg Tilton, you can find me at megtiltoncoaching.com or on Instagram at megtiltoncoaching. And you can find me at rondafar.com or on Instagram at rondafar underscore coaching. But while we always appreciate new followers, it's better to follow the prophet and the apostles themselves. Yep. Although we love speaking about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions. 
Join us next week for some more personal opinions on the Conference Talk podcast. Thank you.